In motor racing, triumph and tragedy are often just inches apart, and at no place is that as true as it is on the Nürburgring. Close to the middle of nowhere in the Eiffel in West Germany lies one of the greatest, best and most dangerous racetracks of the world. Today I want to talk a little bit about this track in this kind of one-off video before I'll race on the old Nürburgring as part of my Formula 1 1975 mini-series in two weeks' time. Feel free to check this out via the link in the info card. When the construction of the Nürburgring began in 1925 as a job creation measure and to lure rich people into one of the poorest regions of Germany back in the day, little was known about what legacy would this be the foundation of. In fact, at the beginning the Nürburgring was not very popular and seen as a waste of money by big parts of the people in the region. The fact that the project was 10 million Reichsmark more expensive than planned did not help either. Yeah, you see, today as well as in the past we Germans haven't been the best at calculating how much big building projects will cost. The image of the ring did change quite quickly, however. From the very early years, drivers acknowledged the track as a true test of ability, but it was already feared when only the second time the Grand Prix of Germany took place at the Nürburgring, the race saw its first fatality, with Czanek Junek of Czechoslovakia and Ernst von Halle, who both died from accidents suffered at that race in 1928. During the Third Reich, the propaganda potential of the Nürburgring was discovered. This is also a period of time many German car manufacturers don't like to talk too much about since their founding fathers more than willingly cooperated with the regime to gain status and power while also building their brand. And that goes for pretty much all of them around at the time. Luckily, the Nürburgring did not only become popular because of the Nazis, but because of the track itself, as the newly founded Formula 1 World Championship started to hold the German Grand Prix here for the first time in 1951. Even back in those days, when the racetracks were very different to how they are nowadays, the Nürburgring was already something special. And that speciality was on one part its length and location, but even more so its challenging nature and of course the danger it imposed. And this element of danger, as strange as it might sound, led to the great success and status of the Nürburgring, but also to its demise. Through the years, the Nürburgring has become the stuff of legends and myths. For example, a very well-known story that is not true at all is that of the legend of the Silver Arrow. Race director Alfred Neubauer told the story of Mercedes' 1934 success at the Eiffelrennen a bit more colorful than it has been, and I mean that quite literally. He explained that the Mercedes cars were on the brink of disqualification because they were one kilogram too heavy during practice. So, to save some weight, they scratched the white paint off overnight, leaving their cars silver, thus creating the first silver arrow. As it turns out, that's just a cock and bull story, as some movies and photographs from practice before race day show the cars were already silver and furthermore it was not weight that was limited at that race, but cylinder capacity. But Mercedes still likes to dwell on this story most recently in the 2019 German Grand Prix when they painted their cars accordingly and we all know how that went. Maybe that is what you get for retelling a story again and again you most likely know is not true. But it takes a special place for such legends to be created and gain popularity. You could even compare the old, the classic Nürburgring, to a mythical creature that is its own legend. There are those that defeated it, the heroes about whom tales will be told and songs will be sung, but as always, there is two sides to that story. There are also those that did not make it and who lost their lives trying to tame the beast. Onofre Marimon, Peter Collins, John Taylor, Karel Godin de Beaufort and Gerhard Mitter. And these are only F1 drivers that were killed on that track between 1950 and the last Formula 1 race here in 1976. In total, the Nordschleife has claimed the lives of 52 race drivers during official events only. Until the 70s, that was seen as a part of the sport and the challenge and for some, 
might even have created a dark curiosity. The 70s also became some sort of a turning point for the Nürburgring, as cars became faster and faster after the introduction of aerodynamics to Formula 1, and therefore drivers were pushing for more safety, most notably Jackie Stewart and Nicky Lauda, who did not want to accept that not all the drivers starting a season will be alive by the end of it. In 1970, for the first time, Formula 1 went to Hockenheim for the German Grand Prix after drivers boycotted the Nürburgring unless they introduced more safety measures. They returned to the Eiffel in 1971 when Armco was placed all around the track but there is only so much you can do on a racetrack like that. The Nordschleife will never be as safe as the Hockenheim Ring for example, just by its nature. So, after 1976, when Nicky Lauda had his almost life-ending crash in the midst of an intense title fight with James Hunt, F1 left the Nürburgring and never returned to the Nordschleife ever again. This actually created another tale that is not true, as people of the Eiffel and fans of the ring blamed Nicky Lauda for losing Formula 1 in 1977, but in fact, as both Nicky Lauda and Bernie Ecclestone have claimed, there was a deal in place already behind closed doors that the German Grand Prix would move permanently to Hockenheim from 1977 onwards, because as I said, there is only so much you can do safety-wise on such a track. The damage was already done in 1970, when the race at Hockenheim proved popular with fans and drivers and was memorable for the racing and not for the danger, as Jackie X and Jochen Rindt had a long and exciting battle for the race win. This relocation of the German Grand Prix ultimately created a fierce rivalry between Hockenheim and the Nürburgring, which would ultimately ruin both of them financially. The Nürburgring worse than the Hockenheim Ring though, which is mainly why there is no Formula 1 race at all in Germany right now. But even after Formula 1 left, the racing continued on the Nordschleife. Its new main event was the 1000km race in the sports car championship, which even when Formula 1 still came here, started to attract more spectators than Formula 1 did. Funny how some things never change. Even back in the 70s, people thought F1 was becoming too commercial and not real racing anymore, so they turned to sports car racing. But even with those slower cars, the tragedies did still happen. Quite a lot actually, but on the other hand, triumphs and legends were still being created. But that wasn't enough for the track and the federal state of Rhineland Palatinate. They wanted to take F1 back from their neighbors of Baden-Württemberg and so plans were put into place for a new Grand Prix track that would meet modern safety standards while also having a suitable length. In place of the Südschleife, a super underrated track that luckily still is alive in Automobilista 2 thanks to Razer Studios, there now was a new Formula 1 track, in addition to the Nordschleife which was kept and still exists today. So in 1985 Formula 1 returned, but that race was a complete disaster. The new track and the race was unpopular with both spectators and drivers. Die-hard Nürburgring enthusiasts would rather watch or listen to the race on telly or the radio while sitting at the Nordschleife than coming to the Grand Prix track. And therefore, once again, lots of money was spent just for Formula 1 to permanently return to Hockenheim from 1986 onwards. But believe it or not, that still was not the biggest waste of money that would happen in the circuit's history. The racing on the Nordschleife with smaller but by no means unpopular series did still continue and maybe it would have been better to keep it that way and luckily it looked like it would stay like that until a certain young German from the Rhineland started to change the history of Formula 1 and the sport's popularity in Germany forever. The Nürburgring once again set its sights on Formula 1 and wanted its slice of the cake. And so Formula 1 returned in 1995, now alongside the Hockenheim Ring, so that there were now two races in Germany between 1995 and 2006. 
Commercially, those years were still not really successful for the ring, but they had their foot back in the door, so when Germany reverted to only one race per season, the Nürburgring and Hockenheim took turns on hosting the race. Every odd-numbered year from 2007 onwards, the German Grand Prix took place at the Nürburgring, while in even-numbered years it was in Hockenheim that, with the creation of a new track and more space for spectators, had put itself into an economically difficult situation. But that's probably a story for another time. Hockenheim's struggles still were just a minor setback compared to what was going on at the Nürburgring. To get out of their financially difficult situation, they planned to spend even more money to create an amusement park track site to help the track make some money in the winter months as well, because we all know the best place to visit an outdoor amusement park is the winter. Not only that, but the whole project was mismanaged. Way more money than planned was spent, and seeing the Nürburgring was in the hands and heavily backed by the federal state of Rheinland-Palatinate, even loads of taxpayer money was burned for an event village that nobody wanted to visit and a 10 million euro roller coaster that only was in business for a few days after years of delay until it literally exploded, injuring seven people. In the end, multiple politicians had to resign because there was some shady background business going on, with some state money being disguised as investment from the outside to convince other investors because no one really wanted to put their money into this project in the first place and yeah, it's all a bit confusing and probably not so interesting for your race fans. If that was a channel on accounting, oh boy! Could we dig into this topic? Ultimately, the ring went bankrupt and was sold to Russian holding in the process. After that farce, F1 only returned in 2013, despite the contract as alternating host running longer, so with the exception of 2019, the German Grand Prix only took place biannually. Formula 1 returned to the Eiffel once more in 2020 as a Covid stand-in, creating a race that was fairly popular though. But after all of this, one thing has not changed. The biggest and most popular event at the Nürburgring still is held at the Nordschleife, and it still is an endurance race with sports cars, just like back in the day. The 24 hours of the Nürburgring. Maybe those that are responsible can take something away from this. I hope you enjoyed this video and maybe even learned something you didn't know before. If so, feel free to leave a like. This video is a bit of an experiment as well, as I have not done something like that on my channel before, and it's part of a three video series on the Nürburgring and the Nordschleife. Next week, I'll return to driving as I'll recreate a 24 hour race with GT3 cars on the full Nürburgring layout as preparation for the German Grand Prix of my 1975 Formula 1 mini season in Automobilista 2. Next week will be my first proper long race I'll be doing on the ring and my first day to night to day race and for a change it will be done with live commentary as well which is another first here. So, subscribe to not miss that, as it might be pretty fun to watch. So I hope to see you all there, and until the next time, goodbye.